Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Wonderful to be together tonight. You don't see my work. Are you there? I said it's wonderful to be together tonight. Let's rise up as we prepare ourselves for the Bible study. I want to close your eyes and pray and tell the Lord to speak to your heart tonight and teach you his word that the word will not be lost on you. And to hear Kate, your brethren, praying that tonight the word will enter your heart and reach your soul. Turn your life around and do that which the Lord himself was to accomplish through the teaching of the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for your people you have gathered together. The children, the youths, and the adults, fathers and mothers. Our leaders, our workers, our members. And I invite this to you. We're asking, Lord, that you open the pages of the scriptures to everyone tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. And all the people that are hearing everywhere, we pray as you are blessing us here, you bless them too in Jesus' name. We pray we'll store your word in our hearts. And the hiding of your word in our hearts will give us victory all the time over the challenges of life in Jesus' name. Prepare us for the coming of the Lord. Confirm your word in every life tonight. And put us on the victory side. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're coming to Jude. It has just one chapter. And we're looking at verses 14, 15, and 16. We'll be looking at this epistle, epistle of Jude, for some time now. And the Lord has been revealing his might to us. His wonders about apostates. It's one does about the people that sneak into the church, into the family of God, and they bring error, they bring falsehood, they bring corruption, and they bring defilement. And Jude is reminding us that God is a God of righteousness and holiness, and that he wants his people to live a life that will glorify him and show that we have come to Christ, and the presence of Christ in our lives means a lot, and it means a life of righteousness and a life of holiness. And he tells us now, he wants us. He's coming back uh, to, you know, some historical facts. He's told us about Cain. He's told us about Balaam. And he's told us about Korah and his company and their conspiracy. And now he's going to tell us something about the coming of the Lord. That's why we're looking at it from verse 14 and it says, And Enoch also, here is Jude telling us, and he's going back to the very beginning. He's going back to the time even before the fall. And he tells us about Enoch and Enoch also. The servant from Adam prophesied of these saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. You wonder how Enoch, living so early, if you know the history of the world in the early times, this was just after the fall of man, and it was before the flood that came in the days of Noah. And here Enoch is telling us, looking ahead, looking to the very last, last part of the world, and looking to the latter end of the earth, is saying, the Lord is coming. And this is talking about the coming of the Lord the second time. It's come the first time, behold, uh, behold him, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He came at Calvary and he took away our sins. He came and he died for us. Died for our sins so that we can be washed and cleansed and forgiven and saved through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember, he was buried and then he rose again and then he appeared to his own disciples about uh, 40 days with infallible proofs that this is me, the Christ who died. And the Christ was buried and the Christ who rose from the dead and then we're told that after some days with them, 
he was instructing them and then he went to heaven but the angels appeared and said ye men of galilee why are you standing here gazing up into the sky this same jesus whom you have seen going to heaven is coming again jesus is coming again i said jesus is coming again those angels said it but now we're going back to the very beginning of the history of the world and he's telling us that even enoch he said it look at that verse again it says and enoch also the servant from adam prophesied of these when he said of this, who is he talking about? He's talking about the people we learned of the other time, uh, trees without fruit, twice dead, and plucked off from the roots. He's talking about the clouds without water. He's talking about the people that follow the pernicious ways, and they go the way of Cain, they go the way of Balaam, and they go the way of Korah. And he says one to them, and he's now telling us that Enoch prophesied of them, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh, the Lord is coming. With ten thousands of his sins, what's he coming to do? Enoch even knew what Christ will do when he comes the second time. If you've learned about the coming of the Lord, he's coming to take the church away. That's the rapture. That's the first phase of his coming again. And then after seven years of tribulation, and then the people of God are with Christ up in the air. With the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then he comes to set up his kingdom. At the beginning of that kingdom, he will judge the nations it will judge the sinners and that's what Enoch is talking about and it says to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all the ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him is looking at the whole panorama of history from the time of that time before the flood until the flood until after the flood until the time of the law on the time of the prophets until the time of the kings until when Christ will come the first time until all these thousands of years that will pass and it says at the end of the history of the world all these ungodly people they will face the evaluation of God the examination of God there's a reckoning day that is coming there's a judgment day that is coming and it says all those ungodly people of all the things they've ungodly done, ungodly said, ungodly perpetrated, it says the God of heaven will bring judgment on them through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he tells us, it says, these people I'm talking about, look at verse 16, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust, and their mouth, uh, it says, their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. You know, uh, that uh, Enoch, he walked with God. Maybe you've never learned anything about Enoch. You just thought he lived a righteous life. Yes, he did more. Maybe you just thought he walked with God. That man was saved and sanctified and holy and righteous and pure. You think that was all his life? He also prophesied. He also warned people. He also told people of the coming of the judgment of God. And he also warned them that if they did not repent and turn away from their sins, he told them, he assured them judgment was coming. And what surprised us, or what impresses us, is this, that Enoch lived after the fall of man, yet he had grace to walk in a pleasing life of righteousness and of holiness, even though the things were corrupt at that time. This man had salvation if he could have salvation at that time remember Moses had not come remember the Bible had not been written remember there wasn't a church like this remember there was no preacher there was no pastor remember there were no encouraging people that would say come on now live the righteous life all alone in isolation he knew the Lord by himself and he was saved and was sanctified and he lived a life of entire holiness entire sanctification even before the time of the flood if he could do it you will do it 
not only that you can do it but i know you will do it the same grace that was available to such a man alone by himself no church service no bible study no revival time nothing whatever all alone by himself he lived that life and he walked with god i will walk with god and not only that this man lived just before the flood and he lived before the flood he was the father of Methuselah. you'll see that if we get to that part of the bible talking about enoch he gave back to Methuselah at the age of 65 and then the bible says from that time for 300 years he lived righteously and he walked with god without any backsliding and without saying today i'm tired today the temptation is too much today i'm at a crossroad and today i don't know whether i can make it or not he made it i will make it you know people like that that can live a life that is straight for a life that is upright for 300 years without falling and rising without backsliding and coming back and without you know weeping every night oh lord i've blown it again i've sinned again and he lived this consistent life the grace of god is wonderful and that wonder of the grace of god you'll find in your life in jesus name it was an era of great sinfulness an era of great defiling corruption an era of him unimaginable evil yet enoch walked with god in holiness and righteousness all the days of his life after his conversion at the age of 65 enoch lived during a period of spiritual ignorance spiritual ignorance there was no revelation of the truth of god no revelation of sound doctrine and no revelation of the bible as we have it now but even though he lived at a time of gross darkness yet he had revelation about god revelation about the saints it says his coming with ten thousands of his saints he had revelation about christ about the lord who will come the first time and he will come again and he has revelation about the second coming of the lord and the judgment of the world if that man at that age at that time in that era at that period could have such a knowledge and now we have been given the knowledge in the bible for us to read you will read the bible you will learn the bible and you will not be ignorant of the things of the lord in jesus name we're looking at this word tonight enoch's prophecy concerning christ's second coming enoch's prophecy that's what it says it says enoch also the seventh from adam prophesied of thee saying behold the lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints enoch's prophecy concerning christ's second coming there are three parts we're going to look at verse 14 that's part one then verse 15 that's part two and verse 16 that's part three number one the prophetic revelation of christ's second coming the prophetic revelation of christ's second coming that you'll find in verse 14 and enoch also the servant from adam prophesied of this saying behold the lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints prophetic revelation of christ's second coming point number two the predicted retribution the predicted retribution that is god will repay those that have lived ungodly lives unrighteous lives and sinful lives the people who have forgotten him the people who have neglected him the people that do not have any god in their thoughts in their mind or in their decision whatever it is they were doing they will they counted god as not relevant to them and all those people the sinful people the ungodly people the unrighteous people and the people that were rigid in their sin all those reprobates a time is coming and it's a time of retribution it's a time of judgment the predicted retribution at christ's second coming when he comes it will judge the world it will judge the evil in the world and i pray you'll not remain in evil the blood of Jesus comes over your soul and cleanses you and washes you and changes your life and turns you around and you become a new creature in Christ so that you will escape the judgment that is coming on that final day. The predicted retribution at Christ's second coming. Point number three, the punishable reprobates. 
who are the people that will be punished it tells us in part, uh, part of verse 15 uh, and part of verse 16 it talks about the people who are ungodly it talks about the people who have ungodly deeds it talks about the people who commit ungodly acts, and it talks about the people whose speeches are harsh blasphemous against the lord and then he talks about them in verse 16 it says they are murmurers it says they are complainers it says they are walking after their own laws they have not been divorced from their depravity and from their sinfulness and it says their mouth speaketh grace welling words have immense persons in admiration because of advantage it says these reprobates are going to be punished by the lord the punishable reprobates are Christ's second coming. That's point number three. We come to point number one. You'll tell me point number one over there. The prophetic revelation of Christ's second coming. We're coming to Jude chapter 1 verse 14. And Enoch also and Enoch also. Uh, that word also, what does that mean? It says other people have spoken about this. The second coming of the Lord is not a strange doctrine. It's not an isolated doctrine. It's not peculiar to just this man or that man. From the Old Testament all through the, to the New Testament and from the prophets to Jesus Christ himself we have the revelation of the coming of Christ. The revelation that he will come again. That's why it says others have spoken about it but look at this and enoch also the seventh from adam and when he says the seventh from adam he's talking about uh, you know adam begat uh, this and then that begat this that begat this until the seventh the generation that he came now to the time of enoch and he says the seventh from uh, adam prophesied of this proclaimed of this predicted of this the spirit of prophecy came upon him and he prophesied by the spirit of prophecy this truth of the word of god and he says behold the lord cometh it's like i'm seeing him it's like a when john the baptist said behold the lamb it's like a when the prophet said behold he is coming your king is coming that's the same way he said i see him he is coming and he says behold the lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints this revelation of god the very fact that christ is coming revealed unto this man enoch let's come to genesis chapter 5 and we're looking at uh, this uh, man enoch we're looking at chapter 5 of genesis verse 22 and enoch walked with god after he begat methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters and Enoch walked with God. Look up for here for a moment. If you were with somebody you love, somebody you appreciate, somebody you are intimate with, and you are walking together every time, you wake up in the morning, and then you are walking to, you are strolling together. You go here, you go there. Everywhere he goes, you go. Everywhere you go, he goes. And you're walking together. Who do you think you'll be doing? You'll be talking together. He'll be telling you what he knows. And the things that you need to understand, you'll be asking questions. How can that be? How can this be? As Enoch walked with God, they were so close. They were so intimate. They were discussing together. And the Almighty God showed him the panorama of events that will take place. At the, the first coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ. And he knew all that because he was walking with God. And two cannot walk together except they be agreed. Because he was so intimate with God, he listened to God and God spoke to him. The Lord assured him that Christ is only begotten son. That Christ the Lord, that he will be coming and when he comes this is what he will do if you have some questions you have some controversy you have some problems in your mind and you're walking with somebody that has all knowledge somebody that has all the light somebody that has all the intelligence somebody that has all the wisdom and you're so intimate together and you're walking together what do you think you'll do you'll ask questions you'll ask questions when enoch saw all around him the, the corruption all the defilement around him and he sees the way the world was going going from defilement to defilement and going from bad to worse he was asking god oh god how about these people why are these people like this it 
it was at such a time when Enoch was walking with God that he revealed to him that the Lord will come. And when he comes again, he's going to bring judgment upon the people of the world. Even though Enoch lived before the time of Abraham and he lived before the time of Moses, yet he had definite understanding of God's truth of God's nature and of God's uh, of God's plan of redemption and of prophetic events it wasn't the only one do you know that uh, job also even though job lived at such a time far away actually it's not in the place where you find the book of job that's not the time job lived he lived at a much early time how do we know that because he was still sacrificing you know for his sons because moses had not come at that time and because the priest high priest system had not come at that time because of that he says maybe my sons have done something wrong my children have done something wrong and then he will make sacrifice for them you couldn't do that after moses that has to be before the time of moses and even though job lived at such a time far away in the history of the world look at his knowledge about the coming of the lord we're looking at job chapter 19 in Job chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 25. For you to understand that uh, Enoch was not an isolated case of revelation, an isolated case of knowing that Christ will come again the second time. And when he comes, he's going to bring judgment upon the people of the world. We're looking at Job chapter 19, verse 25. For I know, for I know, for I know that my Redeemer liveth. Think about that. Far back in the Old Testament, before the time of Moses and before the time of Joshua, before the time of Elijah and Elisha, that a man can rise up and say, I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand when? Tell me out loud. At the latter day upon the earth, very clear that when that my Redeemer Christ, when he comes, it's not going to be a phantom. It's not going to be an imagination. It's not going to be in the in spirit. It's going to be in reality. My Redeemer is going to come and it will stand upon the earth. But this will be in the latter days. And then it says, though my skin warm, warms, destroy the body. Hold on. What does that mean? Though my skin warms, destroy the body. That means even though I die and the worms eat my flesh and everything decays yet he says I know in my flesh I shall see God in my flesh I shall see God what's that talking about that's talking about resurrection even though I die and the worms destroy my flesh. Yet I know this. Because I know that my Redeemer liveth. I know he is coming. And when he comes, I will see him. And then he calls that Redeemer. What's the last word there in verse 26? I said, what's the last word in verse 26? God. He calls the Redeemer God. Think about that. It's like when Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And I was talking to Jesus. And the same thing here, this uh, man Job is saying, my Redeemer is God. And I know he's coming. And when he comes again, I will see, he says, whom I shall see for myself. And my eyes shall behold, and not another, though my race be consumed within me. Again, that's talking about the latter days. He's talking about the coming of the Lord. Enoch knew about it. Not only Enoch, also Job knew about it. Look at Psalm 50. In Psalm 50, I'm reading from verse 3. Psalm 50, when looking at verse 3, it says, Our God shall come. You see that our God shall come. These are people on earth and they are saying that, you know, hold on a minute. Our God is coming. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming. The prophets, they spoke about the second coming of the Lord. All these writers of the Old Testament, they spoke about the coming of the Lord. Our God shall come and shall not give silence. A fire shall devour before him and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. It shall call 
to the heavens from above and to the earth and that he may judge his people that she may judge his people isn't that what enoch is telling us that when christ comes when he comes the second time he will lay his throne and then he will set up his throne and there will be judgment we're coming to daniel the revelation that christ is coming the revelation that when he comes the second time there will be judgment in daniel i'm looking at chapter 7 daniel chapter 7 i'm reading from verse 9 daniel chapter 7 7 and we're looking at verse 9 you see something here it says in daniel chapter 7 verse uh, tell me the verse verse 9 in verse 9 it says i beheld that the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit ancient of days this who is that who is ancient of days almighty god ancient of days this is whose garment was white as snow and the air of his said like the pure wool his throne was like fairy flame and his wheels as burning fire a forest stream issued and came forth from before him thousands and thousands ministered unto him and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him and the judgment was said and the books were open you see that that when god will judge he'll not just be judging from i think i suppose didn't you do this didn't you do that no it's on record everything we do everything we say everywhere we go if we're not born again if we're not cleansed if we're not forgiven if our lives have not been changed if the record in the book of records have not been cleansed away everything we've done is there and it says on that judgment day when christ shall come and then he will set all the people before him the books will be opened come to verse 13 in verse 13 i saw in the night vision behold one like tell me who is that jesus christ you see all these old testament people they had read revelation definite revelation that jesus christ is coming and he's coming when he comes again he's going to bring judgment he said and i saw in verse 13 in the night vision and behold one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days who is that again almighty god jesus christ the son the son of man he came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people and nations and languages should serve him his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that shall not be destroyed somebody said amen, amen. Christ is coming. And Jesus Christ mentioned that also when he was here on earth. You've seen all these Old Testament characters and personalities talking about Christ is coming. Enoch said, Christ is coming again. Job said, Christ is coming again. And uh, the Sami said, Christ is coming again. And Daniel has assured us, Christ is coming again. And Christ himself when he was here on earth, he emphasized over and over again that he, he came for the first time but he came at this time the first time to die for the sins of the whole world to make atonement for your sin so that you can be saved so that you can come to know the lord and your life will totally turn around by the grace of god through the cleansing of the blood of the lord but then he said i'm coming again and when i come again it will be a time not a time of my god my god why have you forsaken me uh -uh. that was the time he was making atonement for our sins but now it comes with authority and it comes with power and it comes at the king having dominion having power and authority this that's what he said look at this in chapter 24 of matthew matthew chapter 24 i'm reading from verse 29 it says in verse 29 immediately after the tribulation of those days you remember we said that that and now when christ comes now the first time uh, what the first phase of that coming that's the rapture the saints will be taken away to heaven and then after several years of tribulation it will come that's what he's talking about immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give a light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken 
then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Uh, that's talking about the second coming of the Lord. Christ is coming. And you need to prepare to get ready. We're looking at chapter 25, verse 31. Chapter 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. That will be the time of judgment, verse 32. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth a sheep from the goats. As um, he was uh, now getting to the end of his earthly ministry, at the time of his first coming, he was telling the people to get ready and prepare so that we just don't know about um, the coming of the Lord and then fold our hands. Okay, he's coming, let him come. He's coming, I'll see what happens when he comes. He says, no, you need to get ready, you need to get prepared. Because many of the people in the world, they will not understand that Christ is coming again. And there will be no preparation. They will not know that we ought to repent. And we ought to come into the kingdom of God. We ought to be born again. And be children of God who are children of the king and children of the kingdom. But thank God we know. And the knowledge you have will do something practical in your life in Jesus' name. Look at Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 21 rather, Luke chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 25, Luke chapter 21, verse 25, are you there? It says, and there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon their distress of nations, and perplexity, the sea, and the waves roaring. And that's talking about all the uh, perplexities that will happen, all the confusion that will happen, all the wars that will happen, and all the terrible things that will happen, just before the coming of the Lord, when he's coming again, in verse 26, means has failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are Come in on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man come in in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So, and he spake to them a parable: Behold, the fig tree and all the trees, when they when they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that the summer is now near at hand so likewise ye when ye see these things come to pass ye know that know ye that the kingdom of God is at hand verily I say unto you this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled it's talking about the things we see the earthquake the war of a nation against nation, the devastations and destructions and desolations that are taking place in the time in which we live, in the age in which we live. It says, when you see these things coming to pass, you know that the coming of the Lord is very near heaven and I shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Do I have to do anything or you know, just have the knowledge? Do I have to get prepared or we just say, okay, I thank the Lord, I have that knowledge, I have that understanding. When Enoch had the understanding, you know what he did? He walked with God. He intensified his devotion and his worship before the Lord. He had the knowledge that the Lord is coming and is going to judge the people that are ungodly. Because of that knowledge, he let everything that was evil, everything that was corrupt, and he said, I know the Lord is coming, judgment is coming. Because of that, I'm going to stay close and intimate with the Lord. The same thing, as we are now knowing, as we are now learning of the coming of the Lord, there is an attitude you ought to have, there's an experience you ought to have, there's a disposition you ought to manifest, and there's a carefulness. Living in holiness you ought to manifest. Look at verse 34. That's why it says, and take ye to yourselves, lest at any time, any time, any time, your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that they come upon you unawares. 
years. For as the snare shall it come upon all them that dwell upon the face of the whole earth, they'll be unprepared. They'll still be dancing and drinking. They'll still be, you know, planting and reaping. And they'll still be doing business and all that. They don't know that anything is going to happen at all. But thank God I know. I say, thank God I know. And because you know you are going to make appropriate preparation in Jesus' name. What preparation? Look at verse 36. What she therefore and pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all this sin that shall come upon, that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. I'll be ready. In Second Thessalonians chapter two, chapter one. Second Thessalonians chapter one. I'm reading here from verse seven. Second Thessalonians chapter one, and we're reading from verse seven. It says, "To you who are troubled, rest with us. To you who are tempted, rest with us. To you who are tried, rest with us. To you who suffer persecution, rest with us." Then it says, "When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven." with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God. When he comes he's going to judge the people that know not God. How do you know they don't know God? Because they don't know the nature of God. They don't know the demands of God. They don't know the character God appreciates. They don't know how to please the Lord and he'll take vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired in all them that believe, because her testimony among you was believed in that day. It tells us in Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, the certainty of his coming, and then the things that will happen at a time when he comes. Revelation chapter 1 verse 7, behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, everybody, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. That time when he comes, see what will now happen, chapter 11 of Revelation. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his, and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. If you are born again, you reign with him. You are a child of God, you reign with him. If, if, if you're born again, you're a child of God. You're not looking forward to the coming of the Lord with fear. With fear. No, you're saying, even so, come Lord Jesus. You are rejoicing because that's going to be, be the day of your coronation, the day of your crowning. I pray you'll be there in Jesus' name. What does it take? If we're going to be ready for the coming of the Lord, what does it take? What should you do? In what stage should you be? We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 12. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love, one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, for the purpose, here is the goal. He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. The Lord will do it. Even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. He's saying that we need to be unblameable in holiness. It's not a kind of pretending holiness that before men will appear holy and then in the private, in the secret, we're doing or not. He says no. The holiness Christ gives and the holiness that uh, he wants to see when he comes back will be transparent holiness that in the day, in the night, in the public, in the private, in the secret, and the open, you're living that righteous life. I pray that grace will be abundant in every one of our lives. We're looking at chapter 5, verse 22. 
chapter 5, verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Those who are getting ready for the coming of the Lord, that's what we do. We know the Lord is coming. He doesn't want to find any evil. That's what Enoch realized. That's why he walked with God. He lived in righteousness and holiness because he knew the Lord is coming. He's going to judge everything that is evil. Because of that, he abstained from all appearance of evil and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I thought somebody would say amen. amen. And I pray God your whole spirit and body and soul be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's coming again. I thank God that you'll be ready. We're coming back to Jude chapter 1. Jude chapter 1. I'm reading now from verse 15. But I'm going to uh, make the connection with verse 14. So it is uh, well connected in your mind. We're looking at it uh, from Jude chapter 1 verse 14 and verse 15. It says, uh, And Enoch also, the servant from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all to execute judgment upon all it tells us that when christ comes it's not just going to come and it's okay we're now going to the millennial reign and everybody come on in everybody now can go in no he's going to examine everyone and he's going to open the books he's going to see what we've done and he's going to execute judgment upon all again let's understand that this uh, idea of judgment this doctrine of judgment this revelation of judgment it's not something peculiar to Enoch. It's something that all the, all the beloved people in the Old Testament, New Testament, they knew that a day of judgment is coming. And they knew the depths of that judgment. They knew the ramifications, the description, and the consequence of that judgment. We're looking at Psalm 9. In verse 9, in Psalm 9, we're reading from verse 7. Psalm 9, we're reading from verse 7. It says, But the Lord shall endure forever, and he has prepared his throne for judgment. It's not something that, you know, God is still thinking, maybe I will do it or I will not. He said he has done it already. He has prepared his throne for judgment. Look at verse 8, and he shall judge what? The world in righteousness. The people that say, I don't know whether there's God or not. Well, you'll know on that day. The people that say, I don't care whether there's God or not. You'll care on that day because it's not, he's the creator of everyone. There's nobody that came here to the world and just say, I came by myself. I made myself. I created myself. Everything I have, my brain, my life, my time, everything, everything belongs to me. God gave you everything and he gave you for a purpose. And if you don't recognize that purpose on that final day, he, the almighty God, shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. Come down to verse 16 and verse 17. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed executeth the wicked is sneered in the work of his own hands in verse 17 the wicked shall be turned tell me you tell me out aloud the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget god all the nations they won't even remember god on sunday that's the time for their games. They won't remember God on the Lord's day. That's the time for their merriment, entertainment, and all the things uh, people do. They will not remember God at any time. Uh, come to study the word of God. What do they want to do about the Bible? Bible study. And come to listen to the word of God. I'm busy making money. I'm busy doing this and that. The people that forget God. In their program, there's no God. In their project, there's no In their plan, there's no God. In their decisions, there's no God. In their life, everything they want to do, I want to get this, I want to get this, I want to get this. And, and they never stop. They never stop. Everything like a mirage. They get this, they say, I've got that, I want to get this. They get that, I want to get this, and there's no time for God. The people that forget God, it will turn them. It will, you never remembered me. I don't remember you too. You are not part of my people. What, what cry? and what wailing, what anguish, and what sorrow, and what suffering will be on that final day. Thank God you remember him. I said, thank God you remember him. 
he will remember you. When he comes to make up his jewel, when he comes to say, that's my son, that's my daughter, that's my child, then the people that forgot God, they will say, had I known, if you are serving God, keep on serving God. It pays to serve the Lord. And as we're serving the Lord, on that day when God remembers his own, he will remember you in Jesus' name. We're looking at Psalm 98. I'm reading here Psalm 98 verse 9. Psalm 98 verse 9. We're talking about the predicted judgment, retribution at Christ's coming, second coming. As Psalm 98 verse 9. It says in verse 9, before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth. That's why he's coming. That's why he's coming. He's gone away. He's made atonement for the sins of the whole world. And he says, whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely. He said, forgiveness is free. You can come. Salvation is free. You can come. Righteousness is free. You can come. The ticket to heaven is being given to everyone that comes. And whosoever comes to me, I will you know why it's cast off. But they didn't come. It was free. They didn't come. Water of life free. They didn't come. Forgiveness free. They didn't come. Salvation available. They didn't come. Okay, because they didn't come, he will, he come to judge the earth. With righteousness shall he judge the world and the people with equity. Now this judgment we are talking about, who is going to really do the final judgment? This is very important in John chapter 5. John chapter 5, you will see in the economy of God, in the program of God, there's an arrangement. The Almighty God the Father, he has committed all judgment into the hands of Christ. You know, if you are a child of God, if you are a follower of Jesus, I praise the Lord for you. If you're a friend of Christ, I praise the Lord for you. What if, look up here, what if the judge of our nation happens to be your friend and then he loves you and you have told him actually what you did and you said, I know I'm guilty. I know I'm condemned. And he says, I have this privilege that if you confess to me, I can forgive you. I have the power to forgive you. And now he says, okay, you're forgiven. You see him now, he's your father. You see him, he's your friend. You see him, he's the lover of your soul. And then all the people on earth, they see that man, they say, that's Mr. So-and-so, he is George. They call him George, you call him friend. Jesus Christ is going to judge the whole world. But now, you are a follower of Jesus Christ. A friend of Jesus. Am I talking to somebody here today? A friend of Jesus Christ. With his blood, he died for you. He bore your punishment. He washed all your sins away. And he called you and said, now rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And then you hear judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. All the people are terrified. They are afraid. And then you are walking freely. There's no fear in your heart. Why are you not afraid? Because the judge told you there is nothing to fear upon your punishment, upon your guilt and your condemnation. But the people that do not, maybe they are religious, maybe they go here, they go here, they go to Jerusalem, they drink River Jordan, they do all those religious things, but they do not turn Jesus Christ as their personal savior. I pity them. When that day of judgment comes and they meet Jesus, while you are meeting Jesus as your redeemer and the lover of your soul and your friend, they are meeting Jesus as the final judge of the whole earth. It will be a terrible time for them at that time. It will be a day of joy for you. I say it will be a day of joy for you. Look at this. We're looking at John chapter 5, and I'm reading here from verse 22. John chapter 5, verse 22, it says, For the Father judges no man, but he has committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor, should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth the, not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which has sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, I believe. He has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, assuredly, certainly, without a shadow of doubt, I say unto you, the hour is coming. 
and now is when the day shall hear the voice of the son of god and they that hear shall live for the father as has life as the father has life in himself so has he has given to the son to have life in himself and he has given him tell me authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man marvel not at this for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth and they that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation that time is coming i pray you'll get ready acts of the apostles chapter 17 acts chapter 17 i'm reading from verses 30 and 31 acts of the apostles we're looking at chapter 17 reading from verse 30 and 31 it says, and the times of this ignorance, God winked at. What does that mean? The time you were ignorant, I didn't know that. I didn't know that was evil. I didn't know that was bad. I didn't know that the judgment day was coming. And then all these things of a judge, God says, okay, because you, are, you come to me now and you confess that I was ignorant. I didn't know. It just uh, closes his eyes to that. But now, now that you know, he says, but now he commandeth all men everywhere to do what? To repent. Because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. He has appointed a day. It's in the timetable of God. When Christ comes back, that day will come. He has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. Whereof he has also given assurance unto all men in that he raised him from the dead that tells us then uh, that judgment is coming and what's he going to judge what's he going to judge look at romans chapter 2 romans chapter 2 we're reading from verse 16 the judgment of that day the things that will be judged the actions that will be judged and the attitudes that will be judged and the things that you will look at and judge in romans chapter 2 verse 16 in the day when god shall judge tell me Romans chapter 2, verse 16. I'm waiting for you. Open your Bible. Was this Bible study? Romans chapter 2, verse 16. Are you there now? In the day when God shall judge, tell me the secrets of men. I'm covering it up. Uh -uh, you cannot cover it up. There's nothing you've done that the Lord will not know. It sees your heart. It sees through the dark, the darkness, and it sees through the closed doors, and it sees through all those uh, things we're trying to cover up. There's no covering up before the Lord in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men uh, by who, by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel, and it's my Savior, Jesus Christ, and it's my Lord. Is He yours? Jesus Christ is my Redeemer. Is He yours? And then the people that say, I hate that name, uh-huh, wait until that day. I don't want to hear that name, uh, wait until that day. I have my own way of uh, worshiping, I don't want Jesus Christ, wait until that day. The judgment of the whole earth, the judgment of all nations, and the secrets of men, he has committed everything to the hands of Jesus. Look at that again, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men uh, by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. We're looking at uh, Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. We're reading here from verse 10. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. It says uh, uh, in uh, chapter 14, chapter 14, uh, we're looking at verse 10. It says, But why that why dost thou judge thy brother? And or why dost thou say it at not thy brother? For we shall all stand. For we shall all stand. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Look up here for a moment. Uh, let's say, for example, now you've done, uh, you know, something uh, uh, terrible, something bad. And you didn't clear that thing. And now the judge comes and the prosecutor also comes. And the angel is standing there. And as you look up like this, recognize I saw that angel before. 
It's like uh, he was there when that thing happens. The other people that have settled everything, they've thrown their sin unto the Lord before that judgment day. And now we're all lined up and we shall stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And then you're standing there. Somebody is standing there. Somebody is standing there. And then you look at the prosecutor and the judge. You see the fiery indignation flying out and flashing out your heart will be beating because you didn't settle before that day. And then he says, uh, you know, somebody gets there and he looks at him and the fellow smiles and say, look at Jesus, he took all my sins away. And the judge looks at Jesus and he says, yes, I took his sins away. Then go to the right hand side. The next person comes, go to the other hand, the right hand side. And then you come, careless. And the carelessness is, you didn't tell the Lord Jesus. He said, I died for you. You can bring everything to me. Everything will be forgiven. Everything will be forgotten. And then you were busy with this and that. You could have settled that account in five minutes with the Lord Jesus Christ. Here you are now. And the prosecutor, your conscience is saying, that's it. I told you. You should have settled with the Lord. And then you come before the judge. I pray that will not be your Lord. Because all those people that do not settle, their sin will be staring at them like this. When the blood of Jesus could have washed you free of charge, you could have had forgiveness free of charge, salvation, restoration free of charge, you'll get it today. It tells us, for we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading here from verse 10, verse 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Look at that, we must all, we must all, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive what he, what he has done done in his body according to that he has done whether it be good or bad look at verse 11 knowing therefore the terror of the lord will persuade men knowing therefore the terror of that day the judgment of that day the fiery indignation of that day that's why we're persuading men and it says but we're made manifest unto god and i trust also i made manifest in your consciences i pray your conscience will be free in jesus name Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, we're looking at verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It is appointed unto men once to die. Is that true? Yeah. Have you seen somebody die before? Have you heard somebody die before? All men die except Enoch, except Elijah. And then it says, it's appointed unto men once to die. What happens after that? But after this judgment, if the death is certain, it's telling us also that the other part, that is the judgment, will be certain as well. You will escape the judgment of God. Christ died for you. Hold on to him. Christ died for you. Appeal to him. His blood will wipe all your guilt or your condemnation away in Jesus' name. I come to point number three now. The punishable reprobates at Christ's second coming. The punishable reprobates at Christ's second coming. We're looking at a Jude. I'm going to read from verse 14 to get the flow of the verses. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of this saying behold the lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all now it begins to tell us uh, the uh, the identifying marks of the people that will be judged and it begins to tell us the characteristics and the nature and the attitude the behavior of those people that will be judged look at this in verse 15 to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed ungodly deeds ungodly action ungodly behavior what does seem to be ungodly that is you do something that is contrary to god ungodly unrighteous unholy then he goes on to say and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him the people who have spoken against god 
uh, God is too hard. God is too harsh. God is too demanding. I don't know why God put this in so. I don't accept that doctrine. I don't accept the teaching of God. I don't accept the Bible. I don't accept this. I don't accept that. You speak against God. God gives you his word and then you have hard speeches against him. He says these are murmurers. These are complainers. Walking after their own laws and their mouth speaking the great swelling words and then he says having men's persons and admiration because of advantage. Look at them one by one. Number one, all who are ungodly. All who are ungodly. It says those are the people who are going to be judged. Look at this in the first Peter chapter 4 verse 17. First Peter chapter 4 and we're reading from verse 17. Verse 17 and verse 18. Here it tells us, it says for the time is come that what? Judgment must begin at the house of God. Why? Judgment must begin at the house of God. Why will judgment begin at the house of God? After all, when the house of God, Judas also came to the house of God. Ananas and Sapphira came to the house of God. Simon the sorcerer came to the house of God. All these people, they came to the house of God. It depends on what you are coming for. Some are coming for bread and water, uh, bread and butter. Some are coming for girlfriend. Some are coming for husband. Some are coming for wife. Some are coming for miracle. Some are coming for whatever. They just come to the house of God. They don't have salvation. They don't have eternal life. They don't have the forgiveness forgiveness of their sin and it says the judgment will begin at the house of God and then it says and if it was begin at us what shall the end be of them that will be not the gospel of God if the righteous castly be saved if the righteous castly be saved what does that mean the righteous the one who has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus the one who has been washed in the blood of Jesus and he said Lord you know me why it not for you I'm as weak as any other person you know me why it not for your grace why it not for your strength why it not for your strengthening power upholding me I would be as bad as that other person and he knows that it is only by grace alone not by power not by might but by my spirit says the Lord those people are saved but scarcely saved narrowly saved because you know if God had left them alone one minute they would have fallen but God will hold you up because he knows that his, your weakness will receive his strength and you'll be like a strong man in Jesus name and you will escape judgment I will escape judgment Say it for yourself, I will escape judgment. And he says, if the righteous be scarcely saved, he says, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? The people that say, I can stand for myself. I'm as good as anybody can be. I'm trying my best. My good works are better than, are greater than my bad works. Wait until that day. I pray you'll not wait until that day. Because your good works, all our righteousnesses is like filled the rest. Only the righteousness of Jesus. And he wants to make a, an exchange, a transaction. He wants you to give all this, all your sins unto him. He'll give you the righteousness of Christ. And when you stand before the judgment throne, you'll be covered in the righteousness of Christ in Jesus. Jesus name and then he talks about the people that have hard speeches hard they talk against God and they talk against them we're looking at Psalm 31 Psalm 31 and I'm reading from verse 18 Psalm 31 and we're reading here from verse 18 Psalm 31 verse 18 it says let the line leaves be put to silence which speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. They speak grievously against the righteous. Uh, first of all, Christ the righteous. They speak against him. They say, I don't need his blood. I don't need his death. I don't need his atonement. I don't need his, uh, his salvation. I don't need his sacrifice. I need everything Jesus Christ can give. I need his sacrifice. I need his atonement. I need the blood of Jesus Christ to always be cleansing me. Are you like that? 
But you know the people that don't need him, I don't need the righteous. And they speak contemptuously against the righteous. Look at them. We're looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 29. Of how much sorrow punishment supposed she shall he be thought worthy who have trodden on the foot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant where we they were sanctified and unholy sin and he has done despite unto the spirit of grace what punishment will come to them for ye know for we know him that has said vengeance belongeth unto me I will recompense says the Lord and again the Lord shall judge his people it is a fearful sin to fall into the hands of the living God and then he talks about the people that murmur they murmur anything they want to do even if they are going to do that thing eventually they will still murmur they still murmur it's like the children of Israel they came out of the land of Egypt and they were going to the land of Canaan. Any little problem, no water. We, we don't have to complain. We don't have to murmur. We can just go and make our request and say, eh, Moses, our leader, what are we going to do now? There's no water to drink. Is there anything you can do to give us water? That's a good way of asking. But they came in another direction. They said, look at this now. You say you are taking us to the land, flowing with milk and honey, and there's no water to drink. Are we going to die here? And all our children, and all our families, and all the cattle, and everything, give us water to drink. You know, that, that's the way you can say something. You have a need. There's a way you can tell dad. There's a way you can tell mom. There's a way you can tell your pastor. There's a way we can tell a friend. There's a way we can tell the church and say hi about this and then they say well we can send to the leadership is the church forgetting this we have this need can the church do this for us can the church plant this for us and if there's any delay in any place we can write letter and we can write in a very good way and we say we thank the lord for what our leaders are doing we believe they're doing their best but the church is so large some areas of our need have been forgotten a pastor or leader or coordinator hi about this hi but we don't have to murmur. I pray that this disease of murmuring, the Lord will take it away from us. And then we come like members of the family. And without complaining, without murmuring, without tearing anything apart, all our requests will be being known to God and God will satisfy all our needs in Jesus' name. We're looking at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading here from verse 14. Philippians chapter, very important. I'm going to wait for you to open it. Philippians chapter 2. We're looking at verse 14. I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Are you there? Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Everybody, we're going to read together. One, two, three, go. It's possible. I said it's possible. We don't have to murmur. We don't have to complain. And you know, God loves us. He knows our need. He knows that all those needs, they're going to be met. Well, why do we murmur? Why do we complain? It says, do all things without murmurings and without disputing that she may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. I'm talking about some Somebody here now that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Our leaders will not run in vain over you in Jesus' name. And then it talks about those who are walking after their own lusts. They are walking after their own lusts. And it says that these are the people that will experience the judgment of God in Second Peter, Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. And we're reading here from verse. Verse 9. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 9. It says, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. He will deliver you. And to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lost of uncleanness and despised government, presumptuous at they, self-willed, and they are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. And now it talks about those who speak swelling words, swelling words of vanity, because they have men, uh, persons in uh, admiration. Uh, look at uh, sec that Second Peter chapter 2 verse 18. It says, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they are leal. 
they entice, they mislead, through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. And then he says, while well, they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought into bondage. The Lord has revealed all this to us tonight so that we can make right our lives. And the blood of Jesus Christ is still flowing fresh. The fountain of that blood that will cleanse us. If there's anything wrong, it will cleanse us in Jesus' name. And then if Jesus comes, even after the Bible study, we can say, praise the Lord. He has cleansed me. He has forgiven me. He has made me ready. And when the Lord comes, I will be ready. I said, I will be ready. Second Peter chapter 3 now, we're reading from verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish. You will not perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought she to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming day of God. That day is coming. Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that she look for such things, be diligent, that she may be found in him in peace, of him in peace, without spot and blameless. He's coming. He's coming to take you home. Coming to take you to glory. Coming to take you to heaven. Get ready. Make sure that you are washed in the blood of the Lamb. When the trumpet shall sound and the say shall go marching in, you'll be there. I'll be there. All the sinners will be left behind. But those of us who have made reconciliation with the Lord through forgiveness, salvation, and the cleansing of the blood will go with the Lord forever and ever in Jesus' name. I see somebody will be there. I say, I see you will be there. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord. Let's really pray and say, Lord, I thank you for the study tonight. I want to be ready for that day. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. Make sure you are saved. Make sure you are born again. If there's any guilt, any condemnation, you tell the Lord. He'll take the guilt away. If you have not been born again, you tell the Lord, Oh Lord, I need to be born again. I want to be born again right now. I want forgiveness. And if you have been saved, why not get sanctified? The Lord will do it. He loves you. He wants the best for you. He wants you to get to heaven.